Alright, welcome everybody to Monster Monday. I'm your host, DM Galaban. All right, everybody, welcome, welcome. Tonight is Monster Monday for August 31st, 2020. And tonight we are going to be talking about the Arcanoloth. What's an Arcanoloth? Well, it's probably best to describe it from the DM's point of view. Picture yourself getting ready for your next session and part of you is really happy because the players are really invested and they're enjoying the game and they are just you know so in depth about what their characters are doing and they are hanging by threads to see what is going to happen to their characters next and you enjoy that but you hate how they have just taken your precious plot, your finely crafted plot points and NPCs and everything, and they have stomped on them. They have pushed them aside. They have barged past things that you spent weeks working on just to give them something to do. And yet, it's still turning out to be a good game. And now, because of some silly mistakes they have made, they've gotten themselves in trouble. And they need a way out. Part of you, the mean DM part of you, wants to just throw them up against something horrible. But the part of you that really wants to know what happens to these characters and where these players are going to take these characters... You want to give them an out, but not a clean out. You want to give them an out with strings attached. Ladies and gentlemen, this is when you introduce them to their new advocate, the Arcanoloth. All right, the Arcanoloths are sly, jackal headed beings with humanoid bodies, but they can employ magic to take any humanoid form. And they do so to gain the trust of creatures with whom they negotiate, replacing jackal snarls with winsome smiles. Regardless of its cho chosen form, an Arcanoloth appears well-groomed, clothing itself in fine robes. Highly intelligent spellcasters who hunger for knowledge and power, Arcanoloths command units of lesser Yugalas and maintain the contacts, records, and accounts of their kind. Yes, the Arcanoloths are fiends, and they are the legal fiends of the Hells themselves. So if you want to really make your players miserable, you give them a lawyer that is a lawyer for um, Asmodeus and Asmodeus Incorporated, LLC. Yeah. <laughs> You, you give them an Arcanoloth that is just going to write a contract that binds them in such a way that no matter what they do, unless it's really what you want them to do, you can have endless fun uh, giving them consequences for it. All right. Um, Arcanoloths, uh, we'll talk a little bit about their lore. They speak and write all languages, making them cunning diplomats and negotiators, or lawyers. Uh, an Arcanoloth properly paid can broker treaties or alliances with subtlety and finesse, just as an Arcanoloth who changes sides can easily turn the best laid peace talks into all-out war. Uh, what the fiend demands in exchange for its time and talent is information, as well as powerful magic items that it can trade for even more information. So this is where you this is where you let their advocate be able to promise I can make all your problems go away. All I need is a deck of many things. 
you put a deck of many things in my hands, all of your other problems are gone. And don't you dare draw a card from it. <laughs> okay. Uh, the Arcanalos are fiends. Uh, fiends are creatures of wickedness that are native to the lower plains. A few are the servants of deities, but many more labor under the leadership of archdevils and demon princes. Evil priests and mages sometimes summon fiends to the material world to do their bidding. If an evil celestial is a rarity, a good fiend is almost inconceivable. Fiends include demons, devils, hellhounds, rakashas, and yugalas. Hey! And Arcanaloth is one of the Yugalas. All right, now, I said we were going to do something a little bit different uh, before we started a recording for tonight. And this is what I mean. Normally, we go through kind of blow by blow what the mechanical features of the uh, monster are in 5th edition, and then we kind of skip over. Uh, what the mechanical features are in the other editions. I decided, no, I want to just go ahead and uh, give us an opportunity to dive in and take a look at what the uh, mechanical features of the um, monster is in the, uh, in the various editions. So we are going to go ahead and look at the Monster Manual 2 from AD&D. That is where the um, Arcanalos first made an appearance in a published uh, hardback source book. Uh, now, they, knowing the way things happen in D&D, it probably showed up somewhere in a publication like a magazine, or maybe it got published in a uh, module that... Uh, was released, but the first place it appears in an actual source book is in the Monster Manual 2 from AD&D. Um, it's called the Arcana Demon, but you can clearly see that this is what um, we now call uh, what we now call the Arcana Loth. All right, uh, it has an armor class of negative two, and if you recall, back in those days. The lower the armor class, the better. So this guy was really, really hard to hit. Uh, 13 hit dice plus an additional 39 hit points. Uh, four attacks per round. 1d4, 1d4 for its claws. Uh, 2d8 for its bite. And then 1d6 for uh, its other attack. Then... Um, it has some special attacks and special resistances. Magic resistance, 100% resistant to first level spells. So you target this thing with any first level spell, magic, missile, sleep, whatever. It's just totally going to ignore it. It can't even hit it. Um, intelligence, super genius. Yes, there, back in those days, they didn't realize that it would be helpful to DMs um you know 40 years in the future if you gave monsters proper stat blocks and gave them ability scores so they just did things like uh oh what's its intelligence level oh super genius and then you had to figure out what that would mean uh alignment neutral evil uh six feet tall and it's a psionic monster so uh just like the um uh, just like the Githyanki, uh, it's going to be able to do psionic attacks. Um, and now they also notice in this edition, they give them ivory white horns jutting from the top of their skull. So they're kind of like a tiefling with uh, a jackal head, uh, which is kind of an interesting thing. Uh, they can fly... Um, at the speed listed for an unlimited duration. Uh, use the following powers at will. They can shape change to any human form. Uh, telekinesis, 325 pounds of weight or 3,250 gold pieces. Um, create darkness within a 20-foot radius. Dimension door and teleport once a day. 
Uh, in addition to these abilities, use spells as a magic user of levels 11 to 18. Yes, back in those days, there were variable levels uh, for your monsters. They weren't all they weren't all a set number of uh, hit dice. Uh, they had a variation. Uh, may cast these spells without checking uh, magic resistance. An arcana demon may also use scrolls and wands without checking magic resistance for success. All other magical devices devices must first conquer the demon's magical resistance in order to function. Uh, and psionic powers, body equilibrium, detection of good evil, uh, good and evil, hypnosis, uh, major sciences of aura alteration of mind. Okay, those are all different types of powers and the focus of this is not to go into what the psionics are but uh, basically back in first edition psionics was a separate power source for spell like abilities um, but it had all of its own set of rules and everything that it would do arcana demon is a civilized breed of daemon and the race for uh, rules from red iron forts and a large number of petty baronies throughout the lower plains. And uh, so that is where they come from in first edition. Now in second edition, they did not appear until the monstrous compendium appendix for the outer plains. And um, the Arcanoloth was is a greater Yugoloth. So uh, the Arcanoloths are uh, very rare, solitary, carnivorous, super genius. Oh, hey, now they're now they're giving us some help. So a super genius is somewhere around a 19 to 20 intelligence. Uh, now their armor class is even tougher. Went from a negative two in AD and D to a negative eight armor class in uh, second edition uh, movement 120 feet flight 180 feet uh, hit dice 12 plus 24 so not quite as beefy uh, thaco of nine that means it has to roll a modified nine on its 20-sided die to hit an opponent that has an armor class zero that's what the thaco or thaco means uh, number of attacks three uh, does 1d4 for each claw, and then 2d6 uh, for its sting. Um, special defenses. You need to have a plus 3 or better weapon to hit it. If you have a puny plus 2 great axe, forget it. You're never going to, you can swing all day and you'll never hit this thing. Um, it also has some spell immunity. Uh... 60% resistant to any magic spell you cast at it. Uh, so over half the time, any spell you, you try to use against it will fail. Uh, and the Arcana Loss are the record keepers of the Yugoloth. All transactions for services rendered in the Blood War go through them. Oh, the Blood War. You guys may have heard about that. That's the war between the demons and the devils, the chaotic and the... Um, the chaotic and the lawful uh, of the demons. And I guess the Yugoloths are supposed to be like the neutrals, uh, the ones that are sort of in the middle. Uh, robed human with head of a fame, jackal or war dog. Um, and uh, they are usually snarling and have looks of great hatred. However, they, cons they do not consider themselves to be foul and they keep themselves well-groomed and dressed. Um, as spokesmen for their race, they can read and write all languages. So, uh, claw claw bite routine. Each claw inflicts a 1d4 damage and causes a powerful stinging sensation on its opponent. Uh, causes them to be at a minus one penalty, cumulative per hit. So every time it hits you, your penalty gets worse. Uh, on the attack dice. So all of your attacks, the first time it hits you, your attacks have a minus one. Second time, minus two. So as you can see, these things, they become progressively harder and harder to hit as the battle goes on. 
uh, bite deals uh, 2d6. All Arcana Loss possess the abilities of 12th level mage. Uh, commonly memorized destructive spells keep a wise eye on their escape. So, um, yeah. Uh, Arcana Loss have the following spell like powers usable once per round, one at a time at will. So, Advanced Illusion, which is one time a day. Okay. Uh, not once per round. Continual darkness, control temperature, 10 foot radius. Fear, also once per day. Fly, unlimited duration. Heat metal, invisibility, magic missile. Shape change to any humanoid form. Telekinesis, warp wood. Um, so this thing can, every round, it can appear like something different. And uh, it can uh, fight against you. Uh, so that's a pretty powerful uh, pretty powerful enemy in addition to all the other stuff. It also is able to gate in multiple other fiends uh, with 40% chance per su uh, for success. And then in second edition, they introduced in their monstrous manual uh, information about the habitat and society and ecology of the monsters. So that was kind of helpful if you're going to place it in a campaign. Uh, and even for modern uh, DMs, if you kind of want to think about, okay, well, what makes sense for this monster? You can always go back to the second edition source books and look and see what they said about the habitat, the society, and the ecology. Um, and then... Um, they play a casual role in the blood war. They're traitors and barterers and master schemes behind the Yugoloth's success as mercenaries. Uh, and they don't perform this task for racial pride, but rather personal wealth and power. So that wealth being wanting more and more uh, magic items, very powerful magic items, and also uh, more and more uh, knowledge, information that they can use to get a leg up on anybody else. Hey, Drats, good to see you in the chat room tonight. All right, so now we go to third edition. And um, so in third edition, the Arcana Loss are uh, their 12d8. Uh, they have an initiative of plus seven. Uh, movement of 30 feet, fly of 50 feet, armor class of 28. Okay, so that minus 8 armor class that you saw in 2nd edition, that's about right for a 28 armor class in, um, in uh, other editions of the game or in more modern editions. Because the 3rd edition is where they made that swap so that armor classes started... Uh, reflecting the number that you needed to roll on the d20 in order, or the modified roll you needed to make on the d20 in order to hit. So you have to have a plus eight on your attack bonus uh, from some combination of magic and your uh, attack ability uh, in order to be able to uh, hit this thing. They also notice that it breaks down how it comes from. Uh, so three of that is from its dexterity. Fifteen of that is natural armor. So in other words, that means its touch AC is 13. And its flat-footed AC without the ability to use its dex bonus is 25. Uh, so its claws are plus 12 melee attacks. And its bite is a plus 7 melee attack. Um, the claws deal 1d4 plus poison, and the bite is 1d6. And um, damage resist 15. So what that means is that means if you hit it, any, um, any amount of damage that you do to it, you subtract 15 from it. So if you hit it with a really good whack and deal 13 damage, it you take away 15, it doesn't even take any points of damage from that if you hit it for 20 points of damage then it takes five of the 20 points of damage uh, spell resist 24 
Uh, then it has, uh, they had different saving throws in third edition. So fortitude save was plus eight. Uh, reflex save was plus 11 and will save was plus 14. Um, now you finally get a stat block here uh, for its ability scores. And then you get all of its skills that it has. Um, the feats that it has. Uh, climate or terrain, any land and underground. Uh, challenge rating 17, so it's a CR 17 monster, uh, which is uh, which is pretty. Uh, that's pretty beefy. Uh, that's a pretty potent opponent. Um, and then let's see. So what does it say? Our Canalos are scribe, record keepers, and negotiators and deal makers for the Yugalos of Gehenna. And then combat. Our Canalos are weak in melee, but they're powerful spellcasters. Uh, partial immunity to spells, so mind-affecting spells have no effect on our Canalos at all. Uh, poison, it delivers poison with each successful claw attack. Initial and secondary damage is the same. One point of strength damage. Now, you may or may not be aware that... In all editions of D&D, if any of your ability scores are reduced to zero, you die. So now this one doesn't give you that cumulative minus one to your attacks. But if it hits you often enough with those claws, it can reduce your strength to zero and thus kill you. Um, so it has at-will spell-like abilities. And then it gives you the number of spell slots it has. Uh, which means that you as DM can pick out whatever spells you want to go in there. Um, I, to be honest, as a DM in 5th edition, I really like the fact that they put all of the spells that are there because I don't like having to try to figure out what spells the thing would have memorized. Uh, I just want it written out because on the one hand i don't want to um i don't want to pick things that are so super tailored to my players that you know it feels to them like i'm actively trying to uh, get around all the ways they can mitigate damage um I just like to have things that are there, and then when we get into a battle, I have to take into account, okay, this guy doesn't know that, um, you know, one of the characters uh, has resistance to everything except psychic damage. So they're just going to throw their biggest spell out first and try to do some real damage to the party. And, you know, that may mean that it just the effect just kind of washes over half of them and it doesn't have as much of an effect as the uh, enemy hoped that it would uh, so that's that's a kind of uh that's the kind of thing that i like doing in my uh, encounters especially when i put in really tough opponents for the for the party to fight i want them to have an ability to win i don't want it to be uh completely lopsided all right uh, and now we finally get to 5th edition, the modern edition. Okay, so um, it's a fiend, a yugoloth, a neutral evil. So, yeah, um, I guess scratch what I said before. Uh, they wouldn't be counted as devils. They would be accounted as yugoloths, uh, which, which means that they will make those contracts so the contracts will be binding, but they will always write the contracts in their favor um, and in a way that gives them uh, an upper hand. So now you can see from uh, third edition, the armor class has come way down. It's uh, armor class 17, and the hit points have gone up significantly, uh, 104. So movement and fly speed of uh, 30 feet and then it does have quite a bit of damage resistances 
Uh, coal, fire, lightning, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks. Uh, or bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks. Then damage immunities, uh, acid and poison. Condition immunities, it cannot be charmed, cannot be poisoned. And it has true sight, so you can't use illusions to fool it. Um, magical darkness will hide it, uh, because what you need is you need devil sight in order to see through magical darkness. But if you try to use any kind of illusion or invisibility or anything, true sight will detect um, will detect all of those. Uh, innate spell casting is charisma DC 15 um, has the um, can innately cast these spells: uh, alter self darkness, heat metal, invisibility, and magic missile. Uh, magic re uh, magic resistance, so it uh, rolls with advantage on its saves. Uh, 16th level spell caster. And then here are all of its spells that it has everything from cantrips up to 8th level spells. Um, Mind Blank, that's a real nasty one to open with against a, um, against a wizard. And you cast Mind Blank at the party's wizard and your players will just absolutely hate you for that. Um, you cast Finger of Death at the party's cleric. And then follow that up with a chain lightning that also targets the cleric. Oh yeah, they will really hate you too because then the cleric's having to use all their healing on themselves and not use it on uh, the rest of the party. Uh, so then it's uh, claws. Now I notice it's claws here do a little bit more damage than in the previous editions. 2d4 plus 3. Uh, and then there's and then like most things in 5th edition, it um, poison deals damage. It Sometimes poison will have an effect, but if it's poison, it will just deal damage. So uh, 3d6 poison damage on a failed save or half as much on a successful one. And then uh, teleportation. It can magically teleport up to 60 feet. Uh, to an unoccupied uh, space it can see. So this is a thing that it can do uh, during, its, uh, during its round as an action, uh, is just teleport away. Uh, teleport away someplace the party can't easily get to, and then cast a spell the next round. And then when somebody gets close to it, I'm just going to teleport away again and keep doing that for the whole fight uh, until... It just kites the entire party, uh, to use the video game vernacular. All right, let's go back to our PowerPoint here. All right. Um, now, another thing that I'm doing a little bit differently with Monster Monday is I'm giving you some ideas on how you could use Arcanalos in encounters. Um, and this is based on a party of five characters of a particular level. And um, it starts off with uh, what, how could you use an Arcanalos solo against a party? Well, if it's a level seven party, uh, a single Arcanoloth by itself would be a hard encounter, borderline deadly. Deadly. You use, you put one uh, Arcanoloth up against a party of five characters of six level or lower. It's automatically going to be deadly, uh, and very possibly will wind up with more, one or more um, characters actually dead, uh, unless you do something to pull punches as a DM. Uh, at levels 8 and 9, a single Arcanaloth is still going to be a hard encounter. Uh, whoops. Now, when the party reaches levels 10 and 11, putting an Arcanaloth by itself would be a medium encounter. If you want to make it a hard encounter, you might add a pair of Spined Devils. Um, 
adding a pair of spine devils would move that from being a medium encounter to a hard encounter and would give the party two other things they have to worry about while the arcana Loth is teleporting around uh, the battlefield casting spells uh, levels 12 through 16 uh, that's going to be an an arcana Loth is going to be an easy encounter by itself and if you really depending on what the range of that is uh, you could add a second Arcana Loth to make that a hard encounter, uh, and then possibly add a Mesoloth uh, as a servant to them. So maybe, maybe level 12 to 16, uh, if the Arcana Loth is your advocate, like we talked about in the opening, then the party has to go to their offices in order to uh, do something, uh, you know, negotiate the final contract or sign the final contract. And when they're there, there's a second Arcanaloth there and a Mesoloth servant of the two Arcanaloths that, that are there. Uh, and then, you know, if you want to put a poison pill in that and the um, by use of skill checks, the uh, party realizes that the Arcana Loth is putting a poison pill into this contract and they've been led to believe they have no choice except to accept this contract or or face other really 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 insurmountable consequences well you know if they're if they're high enough level they might just be able to fight their way around that and so you know you can you can give that to them and they can decide whether they want to sign that contract and give you months of glee um, uh, working on things that could make their lives a living hell uh, for the next few levels or whether you want to give them the chance to see if they can't uh, fire their lawyer uh, at the end of their swords uh, which you know that's always satisfying for D, &D players is to get to uh, get to get one up on the big bads that are trying to uh, give them the short end of the stick. All right, so now where might you place uh, an Arcanaloth in a campaign? Well, an Arcanaloth, by its very nature, it might hold the secret to some scrap of knowledge that the party vitally needs. Now, of course, it would want to enter into some sort of binding demonic contract with the PCs in return for its assistance, and it would likely require a heroic or deadly quest to bring the Arcana Law something of great value uh, for it to give up the knowledge it has. Once again, going back to the open, hey, yes, I know that the fate of the multiverse hangs on you being able to get your hands on that Framistat. And I just happen to know where you can find a Framistat. And I will gladly tell you if you bring me a deck of many things. Just put a deck of many things in my hand and I will tell you exactly where that... In fact, I will give you that Framistat if you give me a deck of many things. Because that's just what a wonderful humanitarian I am. Um... Uh, or if you have a party that's very skilled in negotiation, uh, NPCs may approach them to try to help uh, some powerful NPC fulfill a contract that they have with an Arcanaloth. And that, that may mean that the PCs might have to somehow accept the terms of the contract that the NPC had or you know, otherwise encounter, negotiate, or deal with this arcana law. So it, there's a couple of different ideas. And of course, there's tons of other things that you can do with it. Um, if you have any kind of campaigns that touch on the blood war, uh, the war between demons and devils, oh, it would be great to throw some arcana laws in there and have them be people that uh, the party could negotiate with. Um, or maybe just have one Arcanaloth that they keep running into 
but it's always in different disguises. And in one disguise, it's actually working for this side. In the other disguise, it's working for the other side. And then it's up to the party to try to figure out, wait a minute, this thing, this, this guy knows everything that that other guy knows. Is this really two different things? two different beings that we've been dealing with for the last eight levels. Uh, and then they finally, you know, maybe get ticked off at it and, uh, uh, you know, uh, humiliate it or, or beat it up or kill it and expose it to both sides as uh, the uh, false agent that's been playing them off against each other. So that's a, that's a thing you can do uh, in a campaign. And now what about reskinning? The monster. Okay, well, there's a lot of there's a lot of things that come to mind, but the one kind of obvious would be turning it on its head and making it into some kind of celestial creature. So instead of a an evil creature that puts people into binding contracts, make it a good creature that puts people into binding contracts. Um, you know, maybe maybe it's a celestial that emphasizes in uh, marriage contracts that that it really, 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 really doesn't want either partner to break. And maybe as part of a storyline, you have two really nice people that are both really good and they got married and they had every intention of spending the rest of their lives and afterlives together but now you know after four reincarnations for each of them they're just finally they finally want to start dating other people and yet this contract that they got themselves into when they got married will not let them out oh oh adventurers please will you go to this entity that married us and see if there's something you can do something you can do to get us out of it well doubtless it's probably going to require that somebody gets married <laughs> if it unmarries those two somebody else is going to have to get married and by golly they're going to be held to the terms of that marriage so that could be sort of a, a an interesting and uh, fun kind of uh, twist on that um and you could even give it, you could even give it the voice of the priest out of the Princess Bride. Mowage, <laughs> Mowage is what brings us here today. <laughs> uh, okay, um, and, and then you know the the that if it's not somebody that specializes in marriage. Uh, that celestial could be the kind of celestial that just can't get out of the way of unintended consequences. So, you know, uh, a celestial that is the good uh, opposite of an Arcanoloth would be the kind of creature that would create rules about staying on the sidewalk for the safety of pedestrians and then uh, order... Uh, the punishment of execution for anybody who strays off the sidewalk to help a t child who's gotten in danger. So it's like <laughs> that would be the sort of thing that that you would be looking at there is uh, maybe having it where, yeah, its intentions are good, but golly, all the things it does are just so rife with unintended consequences. It's not even funny. All right, so uh, I am looking at the chat. I don't see any questions at this point about the monster. So I am going to go ahead and go into the wrap-up, and I will check chat um, in a few moments and see if anybody has any other questions or ideas about the Arcanoloth from what we've talked about. All right, uh, thank you for attending uh, and watching tonight. Uh, the our discussion of the Arcanoloth. I have been DM Galabond. Uh, let me know in the comments uh, on this uh, video if you like the new format 
that we have, uh, if you have any other ideas about things you'd like to see uh, with the format, because uh, I'm interested in just sort of changing things up a little bit. Uh, you can watch the other live streams that I do. I do two actual play uh, 5e games during the week. On Thursday nights uh, at 8 p.m., uh, I host the Sword Coast Chronicles, and that is a 5e game that's sort of a survey of the published D&D 5e adventures. On Sunday afternoons at 2 p.m., uh, we're doing the Walker of Waterdeep, which is D&D 5e set in the realms of Magic the Gathering. Uh, so right now they are trying to finish up a visit to Innistrad and get back to um, the Plain of Ravnica, where they have some allies, and uh, talk about what their next uh, mission is going to be. Uh, but they managed to tick off some... Uh, very powerful uh, corpse stitchers uh, while they were in Innistrad, um, and those corpse stitchers were, were allied with some demons, and that's got them into a real pickle. Uh, so those are all on my twitch.tv slash Galabon, which is where Monster Monday appears live. All of the archives of everything that I do are on YouTube, and I had to find out for something for a project at work uh, and i was just amazed at how dreadfully simple it was i was making it so much harder than it had to be um, how to put chapters into youtube videos so uh, i am going back through the back catalog of the videos that i have posted from my gaming sessions and i am adding chapters to those videos so if you don't have time to watch the entire session, uh, then there are time markers where you can go and you can watch uh, a portion of it and then come back later and say, oh, yeah, I already watched that. So I can just skip ahead to this time marker and uh, watch the rest of it. And so we're always trying to improve things that we're doing here. If you like everything that we're doing, please subscribe, uh, whether it's on uh, YouTube or over on the Twitch channel. Um, share the videos. Tell people that you know about the videos. Like the videos. Follow the channel. Uh, click the post notification bell over there on YouTube and that will let you know every time uh, new content drops. We have content that drops every day of the week uh, over there on the YouTube channel. And if there is nothing more. I don't see any questions. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for your time today. And I'll close, as always, by just reminding you to watch out for the monsters under the bed. Good night, everybody.